Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us and welcome to Earth Day Eve 2022. Uh, we're very happy to have you joining us tonight for this special virtual event presented by DMNS at Home. My name is Trent Noss. I'm the managing editor at the Institute for Science and Policy, a special project of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Tonight, we're taking some time to think about sustainability. Uh, we certainly know that with climate change, the challenges that our planet faces are immense and are going to require a lot of action on a lot of fronts. But in many ways, the solutions we need are already all around us. The foods we eat, the transportation we use, the kinds of spaces that we choose to inhabit, all of those can really make a positive impact and they can give us agency as individuals. So I'd encourage you tonight as you uh, hear from some of our, our uh, panelists to think about the ways that you can bring climate action into your own community. Here in Colorado, we're very fortunate that a lot of businesses and organizations, uh, community groups and individuals are working on these solutions and are coming up with creative ways to make those kind of impacts that we need and make our daily lives even more environmentally friendly. So we're gonna be hearing from some of those local trailblazers tonight and explore ways that we can all get more involved and that we can make this Earth Day uh, one worth celebrating. So I wanted to note a couple programming things. Uh, one of our announced guests, uh, Sherry Bill Moria from RMI, unfortunately she's under the weather tonight so she won't be able to join us. Uh, sends her apologies and we wish her a speedy recovery. And the other thing tonight is we wanna hear from you. This program is designed to be interactive. So if there's a question that's on your mind, if you wanna ask one of our panelists a question, get more detail on something, let us know. Open up that chat and uh, drop that in there and we will try to get as many of those answered as possible. So without further ado, we're gonna get into our program here. We have a real treat for you tonight. Uh, I am delighted to welcome Chef Ita Vita, AKA DJ Kava. Uh, calling Denver home, he coined the term eco hip hop in 2007. And he uses music as a way to talk about climate change, food justice, and plant based foods. Uh, as an activist, educator, and a vegan chef, his award winning album, The Produce Section, fused hip hop with eco friendliness, not two things that maybe have uh, always seemed to go together. We've, he's performed at the White House. He's been featured in Oprah Magazine and The Rachel Ray Show, among many other media outlets. And he shared the stage with Nick Jonas, Questlove, Wyclef Jean, and many more. He dedicates his time to organizations and projects dedicated to promoting wellness, eating healthy, and environmental awareness. Uh, so I am, I am uh, absolutely delighted. DJ Kavum, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me, peace and love. What's going on world? Thank you for spending your time. Yeah, um, where should we start my guy? <laughs> Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your story about some of the projects you've been involved in and, and uh, why this, why sustainability means so much to you? Wow, you know, I'll tell you straight up, when I think about sustainability, holistic health, culinary climate action. It's really something that I feel like we're already involved in. Everyone wants to have a beautiful space, but we need to know that there is no way. So composting and recycling is the solution to all that. You know, um, when we try to take care of our mind and body, you know, we're all just looking for a way that can be, you know, of course, positive for the body, but also good for the planet at the same time. So we're thinking about natural resources, utilize an idea of holistic health to really address issues like obesity, at the same time, cooperative economics, at the same time, addressing sequestering carbon out of the atmospheres through urban farming. So my last album, Concrete Garden, um, that's gonna be released tomorrow on Earth Day, big celebration uh, right here in the city of Denver, because I think it's important, you know, to kind of show where the home of hip hop for environmental hip hop is. And so, of course, we're celebrating with that style. So sustainability is a, is a broad term, but I think to sustain is cool, but to regenerate is even better. You know what I mean? We can actually like grow our mind, our body, our soil, you know what I mean? Through composting, through changing the acidity in the ocean to addressing issues of 
you know, biodiversity, by literally planting, like biomimicry. And that whole style of that really opens up your, your thought process. You know what I mean? It creates the beautification in the community. Really what going green is all about. You know, you got to go green with them, but also got to heal your mind, body, and soul. So that's the vibe. That's great. I, I'm curious about how your, your love of food and being in the kitchen and then how that combined with your, with your love of music. Are those two things that have always been intertwined for you? Wow, you know, when I think about that, it's, it's always been intertwined, but it's, it's more of the style of like how we're, you know, creating this, this um, biomimicry for ourselves. You know, we're not just growing food, we're growing people, you know? So with Concrete Garden, we think about like, you know, what could last and grow unapologetically? What well, dandelion, it comes up in the, in the toughest streets, right? You know, and at the same time, we have that same idea of how we can like fortify our, our heart and our body, you know what I mean? So you got this, you know, when it comes down to being plant-based, I've been vegan for over 20, almost 25 years, almost, you know, when I think about the timing of, you know, when I started, it was definitely animal rights activism. I had a deep, clear path through, you know, Rastafarianism to open me up to really what before the word vegan, it was I Todd. I was eating a lot of stews and Kalaloo and things that came straight out of the roots, you know? And with that access really opened me up. And nowadays you can throw a rock and find a veggie burger. So sustainability and the idea of plant-based lifestyle is a really cool way to fight against issues like climate change. At the same time, help create healthier food access in communities that are suffering from food-related illnesses. So with that, I did start this uh, culinary climate action workshop called Decolonize the Kitchen, which was birthed out of this concept called Recipes for Resistance. And the whole goal was to just show people healthy plant-based recipes that they can actually get involved in. So check this out for the start. What's good, y'all? That's your man, Chef Tap live and direct right here, representing Earth Guardians and the squad, the crew of plant-based records. We're gonna be rocking right here for a raw food, no bake cheesecake. What we have is pink salt, raw soap cashews, coconut shreds, dates, walnuts, vanilla bean, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. And you're gonna need some maple syrup. On the bottom, we can either use like chia seeds. Sometimes I've even used like oatmeal, but today we're gonna use a couple of shreds. So what you're gonna need, some dates and some walnuts because we're going to make the crust. If you're using Majol dates, always take out the pits. So walnuts, that's key. So when it starts to plump up like that, it's done. Coming up next, now you got to go ahead and start to lay it. Yeah, you want to press it down to where it's an even thickness, but it starts to push out to the wall, right? That's about a half an inch thick right there. So what's in the filling of the cheesecake? No cheese, but there is some cashews. So you want to use about two and a half cups of cashews that have been soaked and drained overnight. However many cashews you got, you want to cover that up with maple syrup. Flavor, you already know you want to add some vanilla. Sometimes you might want to add almond extract, but then we're going, to, yeah, you can add chocolate, you can add different flavors that you're feeling. One of the most important parts has got to be the coconut oil. You want to get fair trade organic coconut oil. Looking for that high pitch on it. Start to hit that high fit things, everything is nice and thick. It's ready. This is definitely gonna be bomb. Shout out to Alchemia on this one. Okay, so now it's time to pour cashew cream into the cake. Now this is the fun part. It's where you get the chance to decorate, add your flavor, add your vibes to it. That's the best part. You definitely want to have a top on it so you don't get the freezer burn. You want to leave it at night for at least about four hours. But you get the vibe, right? So oh, yeah. it's kind of, you can hear all the audio and all that jazz, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I, I I love it. It's it's such a different way when because you know when we think about uh, communicating climate change, I, I I feel like you're in a new space. You're doing something a little different than than a lot of people might expect. Uh, so as you're out in the community, as you're talking to people. Uh, do, do they, are they surprised by your, your kind of bringing food into, uh, into the hip hop space? Uh, I mean, everybody wanted to understand like, you know, why I age slowly or whatever it is, like why I keep the same smoothie on me or why I'm, you know, hitting up all the juice bars on tour. But at the end of the day, they, they realize that's what gives me the energy to perform and do what I do. Um, and as far as go, the hip hop community goes and then the influence on working with artists who, you know, of course, they might be in their regular, you know, style and their genre. And my goal is to get them to pull them into something that has a little bit more meaning and to write something that can actually inspire the next generation around issues of compost and recycling, all that jazz. Like, for instance, I'm um, shooting this video and uh, almost finishing editing. I would love to show you guys some shot lists for something called Garden Snakes you know, a local artist who was signing Cash Money Records named uh, Trev Rich is playing at the Summer Jam this year. And uh, we got a song together. It's called Garden Snakes. And I thought that it would be cool to kind of vibe on that because we are shooting this at the Gangster Gardener, Ron Finley's house, as well as uh, well-known, you know, businessman and chef Matthew Kenny, uh, raw food vegan chef. Uh, so like we shot this in LA to kind of show what a CSA looks like, you know, growing in your, your backyard, but then selling food to the community. And to be able to do that through hip hop, you know, we know what the vibe is. We know we're referencing it. We're actually trying to like, you know, entice the ideas of changing the market towards sustainability through hip hop. And so I'll show you some kind of quick clips of that. Um, and you get a, get a cool sense of like some of the vision that I feel like is really gonna be able to work for not only the next generation, but for you know, people who really want to vibe on this too. So let me show you how we do, how we get this in real quick. Check this out. Yeah, I know I had enough. Uh, make sure we have the right screen for my folks. Hold on now. You still with me? Let me make sure you're still there. Still here, yeah. yeah. All right, cool, 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 all right, cool. I saw something that looked like it popped off. Yeah. We, uh, we should add too that uh, you're gonna be performing tomorrow on, uh, on Earth Day at the McNichols building in Civic Center Park in Denver. And I think Bob oh. Finley will be there with you. Yeah, here's the flyer for anyone who's really interested for it. It's, it's gonna be a, a beautiful, amazing, party for Concrete Garden, which is this album, you know, this is a opportunity to highlight inner city school gardens, you know, in support with the Denver Music and Advance Fund, shout out to Denver Arts and Venues and, you know, the Denver Climate Action, Sustainability, you know, Resilience Crew at Denver Botanic Gardens, all the squad, all the folks came together to really organize and celebrate Earth Day, real talk, you know, the fact that we get the chance to do it here with you all is, uh, it is a treat, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, before I even get into it, I'll, I'll kind of show you some of the stuff I've been working on with Plant Based Records, because uh, this is kind of like the highlight. It really was pushing like this vision, you know what I'm saying? Let me show you real quick. Boom. Let's see right here. Summary, you know, we're breaking it down. Influence music, culture, you know, um, really want to like transform the way youth are thinking about. So we had to drop seed packets to really like get them into the ideas of addressing the issues, you know what I'm saying? Like, we know what's up, like, it's a higher death rate in the hood, you know, for asthma and just living in communities that don't have, you know, access to organic options that much. You know, there's so many food swamps from the places around the inner city. And so providing like cooperative economics really is gonna like build the youth up. With plant-based records, we drop the seeds, distri dig digitally distribute them um, with, you know, QR codes on the back engaging artists to really create mentorship programs and finding other artists who can actually write about these concepts. You know what I mean? Like if there's a social justice issue in their area, we like to encourage them and like help them figure out ways to create solutions through music, you know? So full on goals, of course, the recreation, you know, got to recruit people, put people on game, 
with the style of what PBR is. It originally started off by making beats out of beats as a conductor for electricity. I got like four different TED Talks and one of them is called Plant Based Records. And it was the birth of this whole idea. You know what I mean? We got team and it continues to go like that. But um, tomorrow, that's that's what we're really celebrating. You know what I mean? And uh, let me get this clip up for you because uh, it's, 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 trying to act, it's trying to act a little funny on it, but uh, boom, there we are. You can still see my screen, right? Yep, looks good. Check this out. Garden snakes out, garden snakes out. Pocket full of dreams, watch your big mouth. Uh, they got terminated seeds, take your lights out. They must sell a lot of greens, watch me break out. Always on the phone, always on the phone. See us in your track, got another home. All the farmers on the block got their skin tone. So I'ma post up on the market till it's all gone. Broccoli in the work, broccoli in the work. Turn the compost, flipping in the dirt. Flip the dirt, turn it to that network. Now you see what's in my pockets on my network. Pocket full of seeds, watch me grow first. Red char glasses, color red alert. Stop yelling at your kids, that's not how it work. Uh, see, they always love the veggies when it's out the dirt. Uh, yeah you know i can i can talk all day but like for real like the energy of like using hip-hop to address issues of what it can look like as an urban farmer what it can look like as uh you know being a csa what it can look like you know connecting with the people just through like culinary climate action and through you know food is medicine i think we can do that we just gotta use some form of medium you know what i mean to make your food taste good so um, with all that being said, uh, you know, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank thank you. This has been this has been great. And uh, I just I have one question for you uh, uh, before we go. If you were to give some advice or or tell our audience some things, one or two things that maybe they could do right now to get involved or learn more about the issues or something, what uh, what would you say? Wow. Um, if you're not signed up for composting and recycling already, come to my album release party tomorrow uh, for Concrete Garden at the McNichols building. It'll be there. We're actually doing yoga at 2 p.m., a inner city gardening workshop with Brigitte Mars at 3 p.m. And I'm doing a culinary climate action cooking class. If you don't know how to cook, come take a workshop and sign up for composting and recycling. So galvanize organizations how are doing, you know, and just work, support them, you know, learn how you can actually be more economically, you know, intelligent, because I think like the best way to, you know, to help, you know, around this is to really like educate each other. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna be real with you, you know, information is so important. And so yeah, take your time to just get that chlorophyll out, get that bukashi, you know, study about vermicomposting, you know, all these things that really are, you know, helpful towards giving back. But at the end of the day, at least sign up for composting and recycling. We'll talk. I'll be at the McNichols building. Come take a, come get a hug, take a picture. You know what I mean? Come grab some organic seeds and remember that, you know, it's, it's definitely easier than being green than we thought, you know, and uh, we gotta remember how we can encourage each other. So it's all a friend, y'all. Peace and love. You know what's up? Follow me on Instagram if you need any recipes and stuff like that, either there or Twitter at I-E-T-E-F, E-T-E-F, or you'll find me on the DJ Cable, number below, y'all. We'll put those links in the chat. Thank you, DJ Cable. Have a great night, and we'll see you tomorrow at the McNichols building. Peace and love, y'all. All right, take care. Ciao. All right. I'm gonna welcome in our next guest of the evening. Uh, Julia Davila is a project manager at Drive Clean Colorado and actually started as a Clean Cities intern there in September of 2020. She's a recent environmental studies grad from St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota and grew up in the Bay Area of California. 
Uh, previously, she has interned with City of Palo Alto Utility and also volunteers with the Sierra Club. We're going to talk a little bit about electric vehicles, which is a topic that is definitely uh, top of mind right now and very, very relevant on Earth Day. So, uh, Julia, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I'll so, go ahead uh, and share my screen. Yeah, go ahead and dive in there. And I'll just remind the audience, if you have questions for Julia as she's presenting, uh, feel free to throw those in the chat and we'll try to get to a couple of them after the, the short presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, my name is Julia and I am a communications and engagement manager with Drive Clean Colorado. Um, I also manage our Drive Electric Colorado initiative, which encourages the adoption of electric vehicles in the state. Um, and with this short presentation here, I hope um, some of you are inspired to consider making the switch to drive an electric vehicle as it's one way you can take personal climate action in your own daily life. So I'll give some background about EVs in Colorado. Um, before I go further into what Drive Electric Colorado is, I wanted to share some information um, that's specific to our state. So currently there are 51,641 EVs on the road in Colorado. Um, and this number has been um, pretty rapidly increasing in the past few months. These include a wide variety of makes and models, um, such as Tesla's or Nissan Leafs, um, but there has also been an increase of new models and newer manufacturers that are hitting the roads. And here are some examples of the newer EVs in Colorado. Um, next time you're out driving, see if you notice any of these models or any others. A quick way to distinguish um, an EV from just a regular gas car is that it's not gonna have a tailpipe at the back of the car. Um, and that means it's not gonna emit any direct pollution like gas cars do. Um, so some of the models here um, are pretty cool and you may have seen them on the road already, but um, if you have not yet, then here are some example, example photos just in case. Right. And now that we have that brief introduction about EVs, um, I'd like to give more information about Drive Electric Colorado. So it's an initiative that encourages EV adoption across the state um, through education, awareness, and working with other committed partners to break down the barriers that people are facing in making the switch to drive electric. And we do this by hosting events for consumers, working with dealerships, utilities, policymakers, fleets, and other organizations to help the state reach its goal of 940,000 EVs on the road by 2030. Drive Electric Colorado was established in October of 2020, so pretty recently, and it's also part of Drive Electric USA, which is a Department of Energy funded project um, that also encourages EV adoption in a variety of other states across the country. Here's our website for Drive Electric Colorado. So it's just driveelectriccolorado.org. Um, and this can be your go-to resource for anything EV related. On here, we have information about charging, tax credits and incentives. We can connect you with dealerships um, and really anything else that you may have um, any interest in learning about. We also do have a page dedicated to e-bikes if you're interested in making the switch to a different form of electric mobility. We do support many forms of alternative clean transportation, such as electric car shares, um, e-bikes, scooters, carpooling, and just you know walking to your destination if you can do that. Um, so our website's a great starting point to learn the basics of EVs and has a variety of information um, to help you feel most informed when making the switch to an EV. And one thing that we're really trying to dispel with Drive Electric Colorado are EV myths. So there are a lot of misconceptions about EVs and we're trying to clear up as many as possible. These here on the screen are some of the more common misconceptions that we hear. Um, the more people that we can educate about EVs, the better it is. So I invite you to check out these myths and their Mythbuster blog posts on our website. And I'll go over um, these topics briefly just to give you some background of how uh, we're kind of dispelling these misconceptions. So the first one is that charging will be difficult. Um, so charging is actually really easy with an EV. You can actually charge your car with the same outlet that you use to charge your phone and 80% of EV owners actually charge at home. Um, so if you're thinking about needing to always go to a public charger, most of the, of the time that's not gonna be true unless you're gonna be doing a road trip. And I'll kind of touch on that when I go into range a little bit. 
The next point um, that EVs are only for the wealthy, um, EVs are becoming more accessible and that's happening through federal and state tax credits as well as local utility incentives. So right now, um, individuals can get up to $7,500 for a new EV and then $2,500 um, in the form of a Colorado state tax credit. So when you combine those, that's a good chunk of change that you can get off a new car that people may not know about. And then in addition, Denver is covered by XL Energy and they also have um, EV rebates to purchase a car. And then they also um, help with if you're gonna be upgrading your charging at home. Now, the next point of EVs not having enough range, this is something that we hear fairly often, um, but it's kind of paired with the idea that you need an EV to drive super far. Now, when you think about how far the average person's driving a day, that's usually only about 40 miles. And now with a lot of people working from home, there may not really be the need that often to drive long distances that you would might think of that you need with an EV. Um, so many EVs have close to or even over 300 miles of range, which is plenty for a road trip if you are taking that long drive, but also just consider how often you're really doing that, you know, long across multiple states drive. If it's not going to be multiple times a year, like maybe you can just rent a car for that drive or just think about how you're going to be planning your road trip in order to make those charging stops um, and make that drive as comfortable as it can be. Um, a lot of EV drivers that I've talked to have said that um, they can't imagine going back to a gas car, especially when doing a long road trip, because since EVs are so smooth and quiet and comfortable, you're feeling a lot more refreshed and relaxed after the road trip versus a gas car drive can be really draining. So that's also something to consider. And then the last one that EVs aren't really environmentally friendly. So EVs are better for the environment than gas cars. Um, like I said before, they don't have any tailpipe at, at the back, so there's no direct pollution coming out there. Um, and EV batteries can also be recycled and reused. So batteries can be reused um, as a form of energy storage for wind and solar, for example, and they can also be recycled so the battery can be taken apart. The minerals inside can be used for other, um, other uses so that they don't have to be mined again. Um, and just considering that um, the International Council of um, Transportation did a study in, I believe, 2021 about the lifetime greenhouse gas emissions for EVs. And they found that in the US, even when considering mining and battery production and charging from an energy grid that isn't 100% clean, EVs are still 60 to 70% um, lower in terms of greenhouse gas emissions than gas cars. So those are some EV facts for you. Um, next, I want to go over a resource that we offer. So if you are interested in electric vehicles and you have any questions, but you're not really sure where to go, um, that's where we come in. So we offer free coaching to anyone who needs it. That just means that we're able to answer any EV related questions. Um, there's a form on our website if you want to send us a question there and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And then we also work with a group of EV drivers who support our mission and are passionate about EVs. And these are our volunteer EV coaches. So these are real EV drivers who can speak to their experiences in vehicles. And then they can also support our events by showcasing their cars and talking to people there. Um, we also provide assistance if you need charging at your workplace, business, or apartment. So let us know if um, you are trying to get charging there and we can connect you with um, our coaches on our, our team who can help those managers um, go through that uh, grant funding. Um, now I wanna go into some of the steps that you can do if you're interested in an electric vehicle or you just wanna learn more about it. We do have a bunch of events coming up. Um, we have an event tomorrow and Saturday, um, some other events in Earth Month, and then through the summer, we're just gonna be packed with events. So there's a lot of opportunities to learn more. The first one tomorrow um, is gonna be in Colorado Springs. So I know many of you may be in the Denver area, but if you are a little farther or if you wanna make the trip, um, we're doing an event in our, at the EV outlet there, which is a pre-owned EV dealership. There's gonna be test drives, the showcase. Um, our team will be there to answer questions as well as volunteer EV coaches. And then there's gonna be um, a lot of plug-in hybrid and full battery electric cars um, that are more affordable because they've been pre-owned. Um, another exciting event we have is in Lakewood, so closer to many of you, I'm sure. Um, and this will be their Earth Day celebration. 
and we're hosting the EV showcase and ride and drive. So if you see here, the vehicles that are going to be showcased are going to be the ones that are um, in the line at the top. So exciting ones we have there, the Mustang Mach-E, the Rivian, um, an electric motorcycle. And then for the test drive, some really great vehicles too, the Volkswagen ID4, um, a vehicle from Green Eyed Motors, which is in um, the Boulder County area. They also have pre-owned EVs. And then the Kia EV6, which is also a newer one in, in Colorado. So make sure you mark that off in your calendar if you do want to test an electric car. And I hope to see you at that one. And then Lafayette, um, April 30th, we're going to do a showcase and there's going to be e-bike test rides, um, vendors, everything sustainability related um, at their outdoor classroom there. And then the same day, there's also going to be one in Erie. Um, same idea, a lot of sustainable vendors and renewable energy information, um, solar, and then an EV showcase. So in addition to attending an event on Earth Day, um, you can also take the pledge to drive electric. So if you're committed to driving an EV now or in the future, we'd love for you to put your commitment into writing and submit the Be In Charge pledge on our website. If you're already an EV owner, um, you can still take the pledge if you know that your next vehicle will be electric. And most EV drivers state that once they um, switch to an electric vehicle, they'll never go back to a gas car. So I hope that'll be true for many of you. Um, another action here that you can take if you already own an EV is to potentially join an EV club. So in Denver, um, there's the Denver Electric Vehicle Council, and then there's also the Denver Tesla Club. Um, EV clubs are a great way to join a community of like-minded individuals, and you can gain a lot of helpful tips from people, share your experience, exchange stories, um, and just kind of build a community there. And there are also clubs across the state. So if you maybe aren't in Denver, um, we can connect you to a club that's nearest to your location. And then lastly, if you are an EV owner, um, you can join us and become a EV coach. So if you are passionate about EVs, if you wanna help others make the switch, and if you align with our mission to get more EVs on the road in Colorado, um, I'd love for you to join our volunteer coach program and you can support at those events and showcase your car um, and just get in touch with more people that um, also wanna make the switch to electric. So get in touch with me if you're interested in that one. And then here is um, our social media if you want to follow along with updated events, um, learn about status of EVs in Colorado, and I hope you're able to use Drive Electric Colorado as a resource. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Julia. That's awesome. Uh, I love the idea of EV coaching. I, that's actually something I hadn't, I, I did not know was, uh, was, was afoot. So that's really cool to hear about. Um, we had a couple questions from the audience here that I'm going to bring in. We had a question about current incentives, uh, presumably for Colorado residents. Do you happen to know what the um, status is as of today? Yeah, so at the federal level, like I mentioned, um, the federal tax credit that you can get is up to $7,500. So that's based on um, your income tax liability. And then in Colorado, you can also add on the $2,500 tax credit for buying a new car. If you're only doing a two-year lease, um, you can only get the state tax credit of $1,500, but that's still you know, a chunk of change coming off an EV. And then in addition, I was mentioning um, Excel Energy rebates and programs. So if you're um, in Excel territory, which if you live in, Den in Denver, you would be covered by Excel, um, then you can get, if you're income qualified, they have rebates for used or new EVs. And then if you're wanting to upgrade to a level two charger, which is a faster form of charging at home, um, you can get up to $500 off of that cost as well. Terrific. Do you happen to know how Colorado compares to the rest of the country in terms of EV adoption, consumer EV adoption? Yeah, um, Colorado is doing pretty well. Um, I'd say we're I mean, we're definitely top 10. We're definitely more progressive than um, a lot of other states. And in terms of um, states having EV goals, there are, I mean, there are a lot of states that have them, but um, with Colorado's pretty aggressive goal of 940,000 EVs on the road by 2030, that kind of shows how much Colorado is kind of prioritizing um, the whole shift to EVs. And then with the whole transition of the entire auto industry kind of moving towards there, we're hoping that um, 
as a combination with, you know, consumer education and dealerships and utilities, everyone putting that as a higher importance that EV adoption will continue to increase as well. Terrific. Uh, do you have a favorite EV model yourself? Have you test driven a few? Yeah, I've test driven a bunch of them. Um, I, I do like the, the Kia Nero EV. I think it's a really easy to, easy to drive car. Um, it's affordable. It's like a mid-size SUV. Um, and then I also like the Volkswagen ID4. Nice. So kind of some, some different options depending on mm -hmm. what, what fits your, your situation. Yeah. Cool. Any parting words of advice or, or thoughts uh, before we let you go? Um, just if you're interested in EVs, uh, make sure you keep Drive Electric Colorado in mind as a resource and share it with friends or family who have any questions about EVs. It's easier than doing a Google search. So <laughs> use us as a resource. Terrific. Well, Julia, thanks so much for being with us tonight. This has been fun. And uh, we'll put those links in the chat. And please, uh, um, to our audience, get in touch if you have any further questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And now I'm very happy to bring on our last guest of the evening. Uh, Matt Bailey is the plant manager and an engineer with Odell Brewing Company, which many of you have probably seen in your supermarket uh, refrigerator aisle, or maybe you visited their, uh, uh, their brewery up in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, as the plant manager, Matt oversees sustainability, wine production, maintenance, and engineering. And he's an electrical engineering grad of CSU and began his brewing career at Anheuser-Busch in Fort Collins, working in several different areas, including instrumentation, packaging, process improvement, maintenance, and as a project engineer. And uh, Matt, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Trent. Excited to be here. Great. So Matt's going to run us through some uh, efforts that Odell has been doing in the sustainability front and how uh, a, a place like a brewery can actually have a pretty big impact on, on sustainability right here in, in the state. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm going to take a a stab at trying to share kind of a broader picture. Can everybody, uh, can you see the, the presentation okay? It's good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a stab at trying to have a little bit of a broader picture, both um, specific to our specific industry within brewing and wine production, but then also industry as a whole and how we play a, an important role uh, with our climate. So if I can just first throw out a few uh, definitions. Um, the first, first one, both of these are from, uh, you know, Webster uh, Dictionary and uh, climate, you know, is defined as like the average temperature and weather patterns in a region over a long period of time. And industry is defined as the economic activity concerned with the processing of raw materials and manufacturing of goods in factories. So with that said, all industry is, is solely de dependent on the climate and the planet in which we need to produce the goods or products for our society. And brewing is 100% dependent on, those, on, on the climate. Um, we are dependent on grain, agricultural product. We have a close connection to, to the farms and agriculture, um, hops, hot water, yeast. Uh, wine is dependent on uh, grapes and another agricultural product, yeast, water. We're also very energy intense as an industry. We consume a lot of electricity, natural gas, and CO2 as a byproduct from both our fermentation and purchase from other industries. And with the last you know, you know, 20, 30 years, extreme events, I would say, has woken up many of us in the industries uh, and outside of brewing. Um, Brewing's always had a very, I feel like, close connection with our, with our climate. But with that, it's had a, with the, the climate change that we've had um, that has woken up a lot of people. So what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to evaluate grape production, barley production, hop production, and their impact by both fire events 
um, and the devastation of, of those on society and neighborhoods has been extreme, but also as so is like deep freeze impact on those different growing regions, as well as in, impacts on transportation and supply chain. Um, so one of the things that we are excited about is like working with alternative grains and being very conservation focused, reducing our impact and getting involved. Uh, one example of that is uh, here in Northern Colorado, we started uh, a brewery collective called Brew Water, um, where we are focusing on how we can educate ourselves, neighboring breweries and neighboring industries around our watershed and how we can share best practices to reduce our water impact. Uh, one of the first projects that we got involved with was a diversion structure removal here along the Cache Laputa River. And it was uh, something that um, was funded by the state and what the collection of all the Fort Collins and Northern Colorado breweries um, working together we were told was one of the largest things that helped them fund that project where typically they don't see uh, a removal of a storage or diversion structure is, is usually not seen in Colorado. So it's a way, it's a good example that where when we work together, even though we might be competing for sales, but we're compete when we're um, supportive and have a consistent message for uh, our energy and conservation efforts, we can make some really, really positive change. Um, and all, all the, these extreme events, you know, with fire and freeze, extreme uh, freezing through the winter um, are obviously a, a super negative impact on our society, the way we live and the foods and the industry or the, um, the goods that we, we need to survive. Um, I will say, I feel like it has, an, a, it's helping the increased awareness that we really need to do something now. And um, what's unique about industries is we also have a platform that we can help share the, the message and help share the importance of changing how we do our business um, as a business and then also changing how our purchasing habits are with our supply chain and help support municipalities. We work really closely with Fort Collins. Um, when they need help spreading a message, not everybody's following the Fort Collins Utilities Department on Instagram. So, but they, we might have a more a broader message through our platform that we can help share that message. So change in our supply chain is extremely important. Um, and inside our walls is also really important, but it's all often, almost always, and I would, I would go further than just often, it's almost always very difficult because change is always, scary for most people in their personal lives and their business lives. And progress can be very complicated as there isn't you know, one entity to look towards for guidance or goal setting. You know, oftentimes as we've seen, our government doesn't consistently agree on how or what we should do to move forward uh, with impacting our climate. So engaging and having diverse conversations with our supply chain uh, within our walls um, is really needed in all industry um, as it creates a demand for new innovation, for new ways to manufacture. Um, one example could be, you know, crop irrigation through drip uh, versus, you know, the crop, uh, cover crop uh, water um, irrigation that's used. But here in Colorado, that's a fear for a lot of people that have senior water rights as it's kind of a lose it or use it or use it or lose it um, uh, written into the law for the water rights. So um, it can be difficult to convince a farmer that we want to help partner with to use less water to make good change when they fear that they're going to lose their water rights forever um, with what they're that, that they've had in their family for many generations. And likewise with like non and low tilling uh, practices for both hops and for barley, that can be quite scary for a farmer um, because that's something that they've never been taught. So the way that our industry or in all industries can be helpful is to create incentives for our supply chains um, to help convince them of what's in it for me. We need to be able to support 
our suppliers, both financially and through education so that we can help grow together and encourage, you know, maybe a small test area to kind of gain trust and build um, some buy-in within our supply chain. Um, in the end, it's going to help cost less to the farmer uh, in both money and time without using as much fertilizer, as much water, um, less natural, uh, non-natural ingredients, but be more stable um, as a producer. It's a slow process and it requires a lot of patience and dedication, uh, but with the end in mind, um, especially um, it's really difficult in, an, in a couple of industries that we're involved in with both brewing and wine production that these are several hundred year old industries and making significant change can be slow. And it's when we're you know, inherently impatient as humans, maybe, or maybe it's just more of a product of our society right now, but we have to be patient and keep the end in mind and continuing to work and not give up as we work with our suppliers and, their, um, and within our walls. Um, and looking inside, it's really important that we know Every, you know, in, in, in our industry, what are our numbers? You know, how much, what is our impact? Um, many industries are inefficient on in how they do things. Um, in practice, it, you know, it, you, it's very typical to buy smaller equipment, but really when you're talking about manufacturing, buy a larger equipment with more capacity allows for more production with less energy inputs. Um, and one thing that we've also seen here at Odell is that if there's something that we're really interested in and we want to drive towards sustainable practice, we kind of have to always keep our ear open and not close a book on a technology that um, hasn't come around yet. So, for example, um, something that we've really wanted to do for a long, long time is CO2 recapture. Um, I could probably bore everybody for hours about fermentation and brewing and wine production. But um, when you ferment, you create a lot of CO2. And for most people, that CO2 just goes through the vent and the stack and contributes to greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases. And there's no way to recapture it because we also need that CO2 when we carbonate our projects and make it bubbly. Um, you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't technology for a brewery our size to be able to recapture CO2 and put it to good use. Um, but now we are like now there is that technology. So instead of closing that book 10 years ago, it's now innovation and the change has happened where suppliers listened and we can now recapture our CO2, reduce or all but eliminate our greenhouse gases at our facility and be able to reuse it for all of our products. Um, one, one model, this probably isn't super new to a lot of people, is the triple bottom line. And I bring this up as like, if anybody here that's attending is in, in the industry, it's a sustainable business model for really keeping everything in mind, the planet and climate, um, society being people, and the business. The planet will exist without society, people, or business. And so, uh, but society is totally dependent on the planet to survive and economy is totally dependent on both society and the planet to survive. So this is a uh, credit to um, Peter Bakalin from uh, Colorado State University. He shared this a couple of weeks ago with us. And there's a couple of different ways that you might've seen uh, triple bottom line graphic shown, but I really like this one because it shows it kind of infers the dependency on each um, each of uh, all all different stages on each other instead of overlapping um, circles in a triangle. But um, what I wanted to kind of throw out there as an idea was that I'm I come from a project management background, and so it's helpful for me to think about how. The triple bottom line works within um, within a project or the whole life cycle of business, where on a pr typical project management triangle seen here, um, if you are going to give up one thing, it's going to uh, be at the detriment or effect of others. So if you want something that's going to be very high quality, you have to sacrifice a lot of time and a lot of money, where if you want something that's super cheap and cost, you're gonna to have to um, uh, give up 
the amount of time it's going to have to um, be very expensive and you're going to probably have to give up some quality. And if you look at it from a sustainability perspective, they're very similar. It's just like the triple bottom line. If you if we only focus on profit, the environment and our society is going to be affected. And then if we only focus on society, profit for all of us to have, have jobs and you know work and live is going to be affected, and so is the environment. So sustainability is really in keeping climate and industry in, in consideration is the maintaining the balance of all three. Um, with the intersection of collaboration, um, environmental, financial, and societal goals and help achieve realistic projects where a lot of times we focus too much on one or the other. Um, and consumers are showing that. They're voting with their dollars now. There's many different um, iconic companies in our in, um, in our our day-to-day -day lives now that have put sustainability uh, forward and consumers are showing that if in industry can also vote with our dollars we can support agricultural we can support efforts within our own walls um, and that's how we can really make progress is by voting with our dollars because in, in a lot of as in a lot of ways that's where that's where the push comes to shove is when we when we spend our money um, and it's not linear it's not easy to wrap our minds around on how we can make change in a, in a, a place like Odell or um, outside of our walls, because it's not always a, like a light switch where if you do something, you're going to have an automatic result um, quickly. It's going to take time and commitment. And we are inherently impatient and we feel it's important to set goals and talk to like-minded people and industries and continue to involve and help reach our sustainable balance for all three of these, for both our people, businesses, and ultimately the planet. Um, and that's uh, that's what I got. Yeah, thank you, Matt. That's great. Uh, lots to get into there. And like you say, I'm sure we could dive into the, the science quite a bit for, uh, that's probably a whole other presentation. Um, we had a question come in about how uh, consumers can know which uh, you know, beverage companies, for example, are undertaking the kind of sustainable efforts that you mentioned. Is there some kind of an independent agency or seal of approval that is an industry standard that is an indication of consumers or are we not quite there yet? You know, I think that we're, to my, to my um, knowledge, we're not quite there. Um, there is a certified B Corp um, initiative which does take um, a sustainable oath and takes a deeper dive into um, how that company uh, is operating. Um, we actually at Odell haven't had a chance to really dive into that much. So I can't speak with very, uh, very informed manner about it, but um, that's one, uh, one option. And then in, in reality, it's not a whole lot of, um, like cohesiveness, I guess, I, 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 not, to, not to sound, um, uh, that's probably not the right way to put it, but there's, there's just so many different industries, like brewing is one thing and being part of the BA uh, Brewers Association in, in Boulder, um, they put out a lot of sustainability manuals and it's really kind of up to the breweries on how they're gonna participate and how deep they go with it. Um, but as far as just general industry, it's a good question, I don't, I'm not, well informed in that. You've uh, sounds like you have lived and gone to school and worked in Fort Collins for for quite some time. Um, how have you seen the attitude change in terms of businesses partnering with the city, for example, on on sustainability initiatives? Is that landscape a lot different now than it was when when maybe you first uh, first started out? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, the city, I would, I would, I would say that the city and industry here, we've learned through the years, through you know tragedy, through um, significant events that have been a result of climate change, um, has worked really like close with all, all industries so that we can understand um, where our water comes from, the impact from climate change. Uh, the city has put on um, tours of our watershed. 
tours of our uh, power plant. For instance, uh, the power plant up here is called Platte River Power Authority, and the city is working closely with them to industry to look at ways that we can reduce our electricity demand so that we drop our power plants demand. Because as many people are moving to Colorado and our, our population is growing, we don't need to build more power plants. We can keep power plants lower in uh, production by conservation through industry and our, um, our community. Terrific. Well, um, any uh, any parting thoughts for the audience? Any um, Earth Day advice you'd like to give out? Get involved. I mean, that's what our, our, our I think one of the biggest things that we've seen over the last, um, I would say, five to six years is just um, a bit of confusion on many different fronts from both our community and um our coworkers is just, you know, as, as far as like recycling and what you can do and how you can get involved. And I think it's, it, it's, uh, it, we have to encourage people to keep it top of mind and um, keep it fun and keep it engaging. And um, I think that's one of the biggest things that we can do so that it doesn't overwhelm people. And, um, you know, a lot of what we've seen recently is almost feels like it's, it's so much, like there's so much that's needed and there's so much change is needed that it can be really hard to navigate. And so and too much information can be really difficult for people to process as well. So keeping it engaging and keeping it interested and hopefully we connect with people, both our consumers and our coworkers um, with things that they can do at home and change their, you know, their, their, uh, how they operate in their community and talk to their neighbors and, um, that's where the real change, I think it's exciting where it happens. Very well said. Well, uh, Matt, thanks so much for being with us tonight. It's been a pleasure talking with you and, uh, thanks for the work that, that you're, that you're continuing to do. Thanks, Trent. You bet. We'll, uh, and we'll put the link to Odell's impact page in the chat. So if you want to see more about what the company is doing, you can check that out. We're also going to put in a lot of other resources uh, for both DMNS and the Institute for Science and Policy. Check out some of the other great work that we are doing. The Institute, for example, is running a grasslands uh, series right now. Those, those sessions take place on Wednesday afternoons, and they're also recorded and available afterward on our YouTube channel. Uh, this has been a great discussion. I, I know I learned a lot. I hope you all have enjoyed it as well. Check out the chat for links to all of our guests and, and their work. We'll also post them on our website and have them available uh, after the fact. If you do have any additional questions, feel free to send those our way. On behalf of my colleagues at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the Institute for Science and Policy, wish you a very happy Earth Day tomorrow. Uh, get out there, get engaged. And uh, you know we're, we, we're all in this together, so. Um, Hope you'll come back and see us again. Thanks for tuning in.